All right, hi everyone. Uh, so this is moving from Django apps to services. Um, some quick background. Uh, I'm Craig Kirstens. I work at Heroku. Um, obviously, I don't speak Spanish, so I'll try to talk slow. And feel free to stop me um, and ask questions at the end. So there should be plenty of time for, for questions in case anybody has any. Um, so really quickly, just to set some context, hopefully everyone here has used Django or is familiar. OK. Um, so some definitions. You know, a Django project, right? We're all familiar. We've used it. It's a collection of configuration files and apps for a particular website. So you know, a, a Django project can't exist without apps. So what's an app? Uh, according to the Django project, it's a collection, a web application that does something. So by itself, it's its own application, right? So it does things like, you know, uh, do a survey, uh, tickets, uh, support tickets, um, a blog, all these things, right? We go through the Django tutorial, we set up a blog, and that's an app. Um, often our database looks something like this. And this nice little contain thing is an app um, right there by itself. If we can pull it out and have it not break something else, it's an app. Um, this is generally a good design practice. Um, hopefully, no one's in this case today. Um, if you are, um, if you've got one site with one models.py, one views.py, and you know, one for each, and you've got something like 2,000 lines and then 10,000 lines, um, to start with, uh, go read uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss's presentation on breaking up into smaller apps. Um, you've got to start there before you can actually start to you know, move to services. Uh, so yeah, monolithic apps are bad. Start there, solve that problem, then come um, and kind of dig into this. Um, so within Django, if you've got a good project directory, it's going to look something like this, potentially. You've got a project, a bunch of apps. Um, for this example, we're going to go through and say, you know, we've got a ticket application for like support tickets, uh, frequently asked questions on our website, and then a creator for that. And within our project, it's going to look pretty straightforward. Um, hopefully, that's readable. Um, but we've got all these different Django projects. Um, so the first thing you want to do is, you know, reusability, right? Um, how do you do that? So uh, how many people have used uh, Sentry or the debug toolbar or something like that, where they just install it and use it? Reusability is great. Um, it's a good thing to do with your own projects because you can get leverage, right? And other people can use them. It's great. It's nice for the community. Um, at that point, if we said, you know, turn all of these things so that other people could use the same ticket application, uh, then it's just going to be my requirements.txt. Uh, this is good, uh, but it only helps for reusability. So it means, you know, we can. Don't repeat things, share things, get leverage. But it doesn't mean it's maintainable or scalable. Um, if you have a app that 30 other apps rely on, every time that app changes, then you have to make sure all the 30 other apps change. Uh, so great. So then what's a service? So for this, I'm just going to say a service is a, a method for communicating over the web, um, but even more so a contract. And I'll explain a little bit more on this in a second. So cool, right? Um, there's a service. It's an API. Let's just build APIs, and that's it. But how do we do it? We've got a, a big Django app. How do we go from one thing to the next? Um, first, um, why do we care? Um, why is it hard to maintain? You know, If there's different files, we have Git, uh, we have Mercurial. It's pretty easy to work with, right? It'll merge things together. They're different files, different teams. Um, but the big problem is, you know, this works great when you're two or three or four people, but your tech starts to imitate your teams. So what do I mean by that? I mean, you start off with something like this, like two small teams working on a code, right? Uh, you're a small startup and, or a small team within a company. Soon enough, you're going to have this, though. Uh, you're going to have your team grow, and you're going to add something like a, a billing team, and you're going to add a marketing team, and you're going to add all these teams, and you're going to have all these nine apps that want to deploy together, all in one code base. So three apps to nine apps, all in one code base. This means you're going to deploy slower. Uh, you're going to be blocked for other people. You're going to be doing more work, really, as soon as you change something that one app relies on. Um, so SOA, right? Everyone's heard about SOA. Um, it's the answer to all of our problems on the web. And it looks like this. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. That's a nice SOAP whistle. Um, fortunately, uh, you know, we view 
SOA and a lot of SOAP stuff kind of like this, um, like the web services Death Star. Like it's, it's awful, horrible, it's slow, it's big, uh, it's heavyweight. Um, in reality, it can be something as simple as this. A service is just a defined contract for communicating. So I can say, curl, create a frequently asked question. And my contract is that I'm going to send it a question and a source, and it's always going to work. It's going to send me back the, the ID of what was created. So in Python, it's pretty straightforward also. Um, using request, you're just going to uh, take a dictionary, post it in. And again, this should work every single time. Um, but to back up a little bit, it can be more than an API. So if you've got a really big application that you've got a lot of people deploying to, you've got you know, a marketing website. Um, if you've got a website, it probably has an about us on there. Um, there's no reason that if you may change that, you should wait for other things to be able to deploy it. Uh, a good example of this you know, is, is google.com, but also mail.google.com, calendar.google.com. There's one thing, if you go to there, you'll see a bar across the top of all of them. And it, it looks the same. I suspect that's loaded you know, via an iframe, a JavaScript. I actually need to double check. Um, but what it means is that a server can you know, be a site or a subdomain that looks like another site, as long as it's the same experience to the user. Um, and this is just a really nice way to cheat. And I'll show you kind of a, a cool way that you can cheat with starting to build services so that you can develop faster. Um, and then we'll actually talk about um, the other ways. So you know, the normal ways are when you're building an API. So you've kind of got three levels there. You've got an API that uh, you don't need authentication, so this is public to anyone. Uh, usually this is for retrieving data. Hopefully you don't let anyone create data on your website um, without being logged in, but maybe you do. Uh, API with authentication required. Um, and this is when you've got you know, a specialized service. So I have uh, give out an API key and token to a website, and only they can then come and create tickets. So it's not every user, it's just this one service. And this service then is responsible for you know, managing that user, managing whatever else. Um, for the API authentication, you know, Django authentication works, works pretty good. Um, you can create new users, and it can be a standalone thing. Um, and I'll dig into that a little more. And then finally, uh, user authentication. Uh, and this is actually the most painful one, because here what you want to do is OAuth. And OAuth in Python is kind of crap. Um, there's not a good, lot of good libraries. There's not a lot of good tools. I know people are working to improve that. Uh, there were some sprints at the US PyCon last year. Um, so hopefully it's getting better, uh, but it's still kind of painful. Um, but you've got to be a pretty big website if you, you know, want to pass around that user authentication stuff. Um, and it's just a matter of becoming an OAuth provider and an OAuth consumer. All right, so uh, where do you start? Um, so like I mentioned first, that, you know, there's a way to cheat. Um, I like cheating, it's easy, it means less work, and I can get the same thing. Um, so a few places I just recommend if you have kind of teams like this um, would be like a support team or a knowledge base uh, or your marketing, so your About Us pages or your social pages, right? If they're tied in, uh, they're usually not part of your core app unless you're building something that's social. Um, and you should be able to just readily deploy these. You, these shouldn't block. Um, so. I work at Heroku. We, have, we employ this kind of cheat in quite a few places. Uh, so what do I mean by it? Uh, if we notice the, the bar right here across the top, um, if I go to another website, so this is www, which is you know, one project, one site. If I go to success.heroku.com, a completely separate site, um, not at all the same code base, I've got the exact same banner. And that banner, all it is, is loaded from JavaScript. So that means I can have the same experience without having to you know, share code, have a dependency. Um, if I change that banner, it changes across all my sites. So then I don't have to deploy, if I change it, I don't have to deploy in 20 places. It's automatically changed everywhere. Um, and you know, by itself, it can render just like that. So you know, one JavaScript, a lot of pages. Um, and that's basically a service. I expect to call this JavaScript and return this header, right? I have a service kind of with that, and I expect certain pages to look that same way. So this is a great little way to cheat. Um, you can go a little bit further and say, hey, here's certain CSS, right? So this is another page which uses the exact same JavaScript, but we override the CSS. So the CSS is different. It's custom. It looks like this page, but it's, it's the same experience, which is nice. Um, it also works for, for add-ons. 
Uh, so Git Sentry, uh, if you're not familiar, Sentry is now as available as a service as well. Um, it's an add-on through Heroku or independently. And basically, you know, same, same idea. Um, again, this is, you know, uh, this is a nice way to cheat, but, uh, you know, really, what do we care about, right? We probably have Django applications and we kind of, we probably want to move them. So um, what we really want to get to is, is La Posta. <laughs> so within Django, uh, we're going from this, this tickets application with a, a frequently asked questions, a frequently asked question creator, um, and all these apps over here. Um, the big problem here is dependencies, right? Uh, that's where it slows you down. That's where it's not maintainable. That's where it's not scalable. So uh, what I've got is you know, this frequently asked questions uh, creator app, uh, which relies on the frequently asked questions app, and my ticket app, which also relies on that. So both of them have some functionality. They both want the ability to create frequently asked questions. Uh, the only problem is one of these depends on one version and one of these depends on another. So obviously, if I you know, did pip install this version, pip install the other version, I'm, I'm out of luck. I, I can't do anything, right? Then I have to go back and update that. So obviously, this is a pain. Every time you change code in one place, you don't want to have to change it in 20 or 30. So back to APIs. How do we actually fix this? APIs really are the way to fix it. And it's you know, about building services. Um, so what is a service? Uh, or what is an API, really? What I'm going to say is it's a provider. So there's a, a certain provider of that API. It could be localhost. It could be your production instance. It could be your staging instance. It could be your dev instance. There's, so there's always that provider there, right? There's an endpoint. Uh, so this endpoint is something that you're going to post to, you're going to hit, and it's going to give you something back. And there's the contract. So the contract is not just what you're going to send in. Um, so in this case, I'm going to send in, you know, my question is, uh, what time uh, is my talk at? And I'm going to say, you know, the source uh, is the conference, and great. And then it's going to say, yes, it created this, right? The contract is also that acknowledgement you get back. In the case of, you know, a search engine, it could be that you get a response back in a certain format. Uh, so everyone's familiar with Django apps. If you think about a service, it's actually really similar. Uh, you've got a provider, you've got an endpoint, and you've got a contract. And these don't directly map up, but they actually do very, very cleanly. So a service actually does mean we can reuse it and scale, and it is more maintainable. Um, how is it maintainable? I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then a service, you know, instead of scaling one thing uh, that's monolithic, I can now scale a bunch of things. So logging. Logging actually is one of the things that will crash a site pretty quickly. Now I only have to scale logging separately, not my whole site or I can outsource it. So it's a nice thing to do there. Uh, so where do you start? Of course, first, if you've got one models.py, um, if you've only got five models in it, it's OK. But if it's one models.py and you've got a lot of different apps, break that up. Um, I'd say port something that doesn't require the user. This is just easier. You don't have to implement OAuth. Uh, port something where you have a lot of dependency. So if you're reusing. Uh, this model, this app in 10 places, in 20 places, in 30 places, the most places, that's where you're going to get the best value. All right, so let's kind of dig into code, right? Because that's kind of what matters. Um, so I've got a really basic model. Um, this is my frequently asked question. What we're going to do is basically take this out and turn it into a service and see what it would look like uh, with everything still using it. Uh, so we've got pretty basic stuff. We've got a title, a source, a description, uh, and then a solution to it. Um, so in my frequently asked cre uh, questions creator, um, in my view, I'm just creating a new one, and I'm, I'm saving it. Uh, pretty straightforward. I import it. I use it. There's not a lot of rocket science here. Um, so to turn it into an API, what we're going to do is first install um, TastyPy. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a great library for just creating RESTful APIs in Django. Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's other ones as well. Uh, I've used TastyPy, and it works great. Um, you're going to add it to installed apps. And then you're going to define your API. So we're going to dig right in. Um, so there's a lot of code right there on the screen that you probably can't read. So let me um, hopefully make it a little more readable. Um, so what we've got right here is our API. And this is, this is almost all of it. 
Um, this is all we're going to have to do to take and build a service. Um, of course, we're actually pulling this out into another project, too. So it's not in the same app. It's in a different project. Um, same app, but a different project, so that it can run on its own. We can deploy it on its own. Um, so to highlight what we're going to do here, um, what's the model we're using? Um, so in this case, it's this model I, I've created before. I'm just going to say, you know, on the query set, get all of it. Um, and TastyPy will fortunately automatically take care of creating things for me uh, as, as long as I uh, put this post in here. Um, so this is both for a read-only API that I can just read data, but I can also add data. Uh, and then it's going to set up my authentication. So in this case, I'm going to use basic authentication, so I don't have to have a Django session. Um, I can easily just post to this uh, with basic auth and it work. <coughs> um, then I'm going to go and set up my URLs. So within my URLs, I'm basically going to take this API that I, I use, um, name it as version 1. I'll talk about why this is important in a minute. Um, register it, and then set up the path. Um, so this is my urls.py nearly for my entire new project. That's all it's doing. It's not doing anything else. Um, and then we get to use it. So once it's up and running, I basically take that exact model, take the API, take the URLs, push that up to a website, um, and I can start calling it right away. Um, in Python, it, it looks a little cleaner than curl. Um, so I've got my dictionary. Uh, I'm just going to do posts. Um, a, a really good thing to note is uh, this os.environ right there. Um, that's the provider, and that's really key to note that you can set the provider once. Um, and an important thing when kind of defining these services and defining these APIs is that you have an ability to set them up easily. You want to be able to test them. If you can't, if it takes three weeks for a developer to set it up, um, they're not going to do it, they're not going to use it, and it's going to be a problem. Um, so whether you're you know, on the cloud, on your own infrastructure, on a, a platform as a service, what you want is an easy way to basically check it out from hopefully GitHub or something like that and deploy it in a matter of, of minutes. <clears throat> and so that allows me to have things like a, a staging environment, a testing environment, that I don't have to worry about corrupting production. Um, but let's say I, I come along and we had, you know, version 0.1 before, and we have 0.2 now, um, back when we had the, the sad panda and things broke. Um, so how does this actually fix that? Um, a really, really subtle thing right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is say, you know, this is actually related to all these other frequently asked questions. Um, this is going to be in my frequently asked questions creator app. You know, when I'm in there creating one, I can say, hey, is this related, and say yes or no. Um, and if it is, I want to pass this in. but my tickets app doesn't know anything about related, ticket, uh, related frequently asked questions, so I don't care. So I, I don't want to actually have to change it and make that deploy. Um, so what I'm going to do is bump the version of my API down there, um, where it says v2, uh, create another API, um, and just use it. Um, pass that information in. And then within our applications, we have two different versions. Uh, so we have you know, version 2 on the frequently asked question creator. Uh, that accepts the related data, and we have the old version still running. Um, and you think, okay, well, so what? Now I have two versions of code I have to maintain. Uh, but it's a lot easier to, to go ahead and push that out and deploy and not block a deploy um, than it is to block the deploy and then say, okay, now we've got, I've got to get 10 people to do things if they're on vacation or whatever. So now the old app can work. And what I can do is track in my log. So actually at Heroku, what we do is you know, log every request to Splunk. Um, and then we can easily search through in Splunk and see where's the request coming from, what app did it come from. And we can track the API token there, too. So then we know, you know who came in, who's still using the old ones. Um, and it's a lot easier to nag that way when you've told them, given them warning, versus trying to rush something out to deploy. <coughs> And so um, where we went from before was reusability, which is great. I mean, I'd encourage anyone, if you're creating a Django app and you could open source it, please do it. It's great. Um, it's, it's nice for the community. Then we don't have to maintain site, site quite so much. Uh, we get reusable things. Um, but that's a big difference versus maintainability and scalability and really agility. Um, so what we went to was from you know, this one project structure that looked like uh, 
this and had all of these requirements if you're already broken it up like this, or it's you know uh, each directory for your app um, to two different projects. <coughs> so two different projects we're going to deploy. Each has a pretty basic Django setting, um, and we have a requirements.txt for for one that's just using two, so it's not using the third one now. Um, kind of at a higher level, how did it, what did we do? Um, my project contained a Django project before, um, kind of two apps, and I don't mean two Django apps, I mean, um, oh, excuse me, um, this is my new project. So my new project contains a Django app, the two apps that I'm using, and its own database and its own deployment. And the new one, uh, the frequently asked question project, uh, it's the same thing, it's its own Django app, uh, its own URL, its own subdomain or completely different URL, uh, one Django application, its own database, and its own deployment. And again, if you want to share user information, uh, OAuth really is the way to do it. Um, if you're you know, looking at ripping out backend services, um, an API key is a great way to start. All right, so on uh, the takeaways, um, like I said, I would actually cheat. Cheating's a really good way to, to start to get some agility back and get time. Um, if other engineers are like myself, there's always more to do than you have time for, so getting a little extra time is kind of nice. Um, create services where there's app reuse and where there's pain. Usually these are the same place, but not always. Um, if there's one thing that keeps breaking over and over and over and maybe it's not reused, um, that's a good thing to isolate. Also, if every time you change one application, you have to update 10 others, um, that's a good one. But I would say before you tackle those, start small. So take the one thing that's a contained app and just pull it out to practice. Um, it's a good way to do it. Um, a few other um, things. Uh, when developing RESTful APIs, you should expect every API you create to fail, because it will, and you should plan to fail gracefully. So it's a little bit uh, different of an exception you're catching in probably more cases you're catching, you know. Um, also, if you're, I love Django, Django's great, it's got a lot of batteries included. Um, if you're looking to build an API from the bottom up, Flask is a really great library for it, just because it doesn't encourage you to, to build apps that are tied together. So Django, the app model is great, um, but it's also a big problem of Django in that you start to tie apps together and have dependencies, um, and it's hard to tear them away. And then again, Please make it easy to, to set up and to test. Um, for testing, it's good to stub good, both a, a positive and a negative response from your API that you're calling. So when you're making that request.post, it's good to, to test you know, if it works and if it fails. Um, but also make it easy to, to set up so that you can run the service locally. You can test when things are working. Um, and you don't have to you know, point a, a developer at production. So I uh, covered all of that pretty quickly. Um, so I wanted to leave plenty of time for, for questions. Um, there's quite a few resources there. So I've talked a little bit about this on my blog. Um, Bitly, Django Apps to Services, um, all of the slides will be up. 12factor.net um, actually talks about a lot of these things, of breaking up apps and services. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow from a higher level of like how it works for teams at Heroku. Um, and you know, how do we develop efficiently by communicating that way? Um, and then finally, I'm gonna have some code examples up um, probably in the next day or two of this exact app that went from you know, one kind of, not monolithic thing, but one big project to multiple different projects. All right, uh, thank you and I'll hang around if anybody has any questions after.